I just want to take a minute to introduce tonight's keynote speaker. I am uh, very honored to introduce Stanley Hupfeld. Stan was the president and CEO of Integris Health for over 20 years, has recently served as chairman and is now still an active senior consultant with Integris Health. He is also a former US Army veteran of Vietnam and also still wearing the ring tonight from the 1963 National Football Team Championship team from the University of Texas. Please join me in welcoming Stanley. I am, uh, I am painfully aware of my situation. Most of you got up early to take a plane here. You've had a full day of meetings, intense meetings, very intellectually stimulating. You've now had several glasses of wine and a heavy dinner. And I am on at uh, 848. Not an envious position for a speaker. And the reason I'm painfully aware of my limitations is that when I retired as the CEO of Integris Health, I had a very large party. Several hundred people attended, and there were a number of people that spoke on my behalf. My priest gave the invocation. And one of my very best friends was at the dinner, had several glasses of wine, had a great time, and I concluded the night. My friend went home that night, went to bed, and never woke up. He died that night. Several days later at his service, as I was entering the church, my priest leaned over to me and whispered in my ear, you talked so long, you killed him. <laughs> now this is sort of a pasty looking group right now, having, and I, I want to make sure that nothing happens to any of you all, so I will be brief in my remarks and uh, hopefully to the point. When the Affordable Care Act was signed, I got up that night and, wrote, and began to write this book because I was so upset with the politicians on both sides of the aisle that I felt something needed to be said because I, I think we were missing the point it was an opportunity to do something very special. And, and as is said on the cover of the book, you know, the Affordable Care Act for some people is the greatest piece of social legislation in the history of the country, second only to Medicare. For others, it's an abomination on the health care system that's eventually going to ruin it. I am apolitical on this issue, but I do think we sort of missed the mark. And I want to go through and tell you where I think we've gone wrong and, and why this focus, which we have basically on insurance products and how to get insurance to people, is not unimportant, but it just doesn't get where we need to get to. So let me begin, and I'm going to read a paragraph from the second chapter of my book to kick this off. On Valentine's Day in 2009, Tina Chumley was wheeled into an operating room in Integris Baptist Medical Center in Oklahoma City to receive a donated kidney. That same uh, day, her daughter Jennifer was taken to another operating room at Integris Baptist to donate a kidney. Now what made this special was that Jennifer was not giving her organ to her mother, but to a total stranger. Scott Clark, who was being prepared in a third operating room, Scott's sister Cindy was yet in another operating room at Integris, having her kidney harvested for shipment to Barnes Jewish Hospital in St. Louis. Now, While Scott waited for a kidney to be sent from Johns Hopkins in Baltimore. <laughs> This was all part of a 12-patient, three-state, three-hospital domino kidney transplant, the nation's first of that magnitude. So let's see here. Let me go back just a second. So there it is. People come from all over the world to experience our technology. And we are proud of what we have achieved. We have hundreds and hundreds and thousands of marvelous physicians, great hospitals, superb medical schools. But yet, a mile away from Baptist Medical Center, this was happening. 
People were lined up to receive free care from volunteer doctors and nurses, hoping beyond hope that the assets of that clinic could meet their medical needs. Because if they could not, then we started the dance of trying to find a surgeon that would operate on them, an anesthesiologist that would get past the anesthesia, or a hospital that would do the procedure. Less than a mile away from the world's first six patient transplant. That is the yin and the yang of healthcare in America. On the one hand, the best technology the world has to offer. On the other hand, some of the most desperate people in the world waiting for care, hoping to get it from total strangers who volunteer their time. So here's what the dilemma is. All of us in the healthcare system are trying to figure out the answer to this relatively simple question. How do we deliver and pay for high quality care at reasonable cost and deliver it to the most people? Now, since we in healthcare have been unable to answer that question, we've left it to the government. And here's part of the problem. Now, a message from the Department of Health and Human Services. Hello there. Uh, I'm Kathleen Sebelius, Secretary of Health under President Obama. Now, a lot of folks have been talking about our new health care enrollment website, how it's been crashing and freezing and shutting down and stalling and not working and breaking and sucking. <laughs> well, tonight, I have a number of friendly tips to help you deal with those technical problems. For example, have you tried restarting your computer? <laughs> Sometimes it helps to turn the computer off and then turn it back on. We don't know why, it just does. <laughs> if our website still isn't loading properly, we're probably just overloaded with traffic. Millions of Americans are visiting healthcare.gov, which is great news. Unfortunately, the site was only designed to handle six users at a time. So if you're in a rush, Consider using our low-res website with simpler fonts and graphics. So, let me tell you what I tell my lay friends when I try to describe the healthcare system. I use a retail analogy and I, I talk about my daughter who loves to shop. And I say, let's pretend that I give my daughter my credit card. And I say, dear, you go to the mall, you pick out anything you want, I'll pay the bill. She goes to the mall, she goes to the dress store, she hands my credit card to the salesperson and says, pick out for me anything you think I need. What is the consequences to me, the cardholder? My costs go up exponentially because the party at action here could care less about the cost. Now clearly in this analogy, the salesperson is the physician, my daughter is the patient, and I am the payer. I'm either the government or the employer. When both parties, when two of the three parties to this transaction don't care about cost, what happens to cost? And that's core of what we've seen historically in healthcare. Now, I think we get off base because we talk about health insurance as if it were insurance. I don't think it's insurance. Now, I, I'm not an insurance expert. But to me, insurance is when the many pay for the extraordinary losses of the few. It's as if all of you were to buy insurance for this table. So, when we buy health insurance, we expect to use it. When we buy homeowner's insurance, we don't expect it. In fact, we hope we don't use it. We hope to God we don't have to use our, health, our homeowner's insurance. When we buy health insurance, we expect every time we come in contact with a medical provider, someone else is going to pay the bill in whole or in part for us. That takes away the economic consequences of our decision making from our shoulders and gives it to someone else. So here's my theory. We talk about health insurance as if it were insurance. 
It's not insurance. It's a transfer of payment system. Okay. In this search, I've come up with 14, there could be 20, uh, reasons why health care is so hard to reform. And, and one is the tort system. Now, the, the first thing you hear about the tort system is that because doctors are afraid of being sued, they overtreat and they overdiagnose. And I think that's true. But we need to scrape away that just a little bit. I ran a health system, Integris and other health systems, for over 40 years. We rarely, rarely got sued for what we did not do. We did not do a CAT scanner. Subsequently, the patient had a brain lesion, and with the CAT scan would have uncovered it, and we got sued. What we got sued for is what we did, and we screwed up. That was by far the largest amount. So this theory that you've got to overtreat and overdiagnose because you may get sued is a great theory. People believe it. Certainly our physicians believe it. But the facts are, it doesn't necessarily happen. Now, what's interesting is, having been involved in a couple of these where people didn't, physicians did not order a particular exam, almost in every case, in every case, the medicine was on the side of the physician. But in every case, if there was a child involved, we settled because we were not going to take the chance that a jury was going to award parents of an injured child money regardless of what the medicine said. Now, here's the other interesting fact, it seems to me. In our historic health care system, the more we do, the more we get paid. It benefits us to think this. It benefits us to overtreat and overdiagnose because we get paid more. So the thing we fear the most when you cut it all away may actually work to our economic benefit. So what are some of the other reasons? Do you see this office here? Every hospital is represented here probably has several of these. Cubicles full of people do nothing but collect bills. Even small doctor's office have one or two people do nothing but collect bills. 25%, let's say that again, one-fourth of every health care dollar goes to collecting a bill. One-fourth. It cures not one patient. It helps not deal with any disease, any injury a patient suffers. It's all overhead. One-fourth of every health care dollar. Medicine secret. I don't think most people realize the income difference among physicians. The fact that a pediatrician in many communities be lucky to make $100,000 a year, and a neurosurgeon may make a million. I don't think people realize that. And if you make a million dollars a year, what are you willing to do to maintain that? I think that surprises most people with relatively the same amount of training. The, the fact of this actually goes back in, in history. When Blue Cross was first formed, the people in Blue Shield, the physicians that set pricing structures, tended to be specialists. So they tended in their pricing structure to favor the specialists. And that has come down over the last 50 years to us and exists today. Hospitals clearly part of the problem. 1999, the Institute of Medicine published a study that said over 100,000 people are killed every year in hospitals because of inattention to detail. We just don't pay attention. We give the wrong medicine, we operate on the wrong limb, et cetera, et cetera. Clearly part of the problem. Now, to their credit, I think hospitals have tried to change, but that's still an issue in many places. Cost shifting. This is very, let, let me give you an example of why I think this is, is unusual. Medicare pays us maybe 40 cents on the dollar, Medicaid maybe a little bit less. Here's the way I, I tend to think about it. And, and you're a grocer, and you sell apples, and you buy your apples for 50 cents a piece, or 50 cents a bushel, let's say. And your biggest customer comes to you and says, uh, you're, charge, you're charging me 75 cents per apple. I'm not going to pay you 75 cents. I'm going to pay you 45 cents. And oh, by the way, you have to sell them to me at that price. Does that sound like Medicare? It's crazy. 
regardless of our cost, we have, to, we have to take care of patients on behalf of the government, in many cases far below our cost. What other business in this country does that? So, as a result, what do you do if you're the grocer? You charge everybody else a little bit more. And that's what we do. History of entrepreneurship. We're not really sure whether healthcare is a social service or whether it's a business. Is it like police and fire? Ought we to get health care paid for by the public at large, as Senator Sanders would indicate? You know, we expect, for instance, the fire department, when we call them because our house is on fire, to come put out our fire. We don't expect them to pay for our flame retardant shingles on our home. We know the limitations of a social service. But is it a social service? Or is it a business? We have publicly traded companies that run hospitals, traded on the New York Stock Exchange, worth billions of dollars, billions of dollars, whose stock prices rise and fall with their performance. We have physicians. Now this is not a knock, it's just a fact. We have physicians that own, in many cases, the means of production. They own laboratories, or they own x-ray facilities, they own hospitals. That's not done in the rest of the world for the most part. It's very unusual. So again, I ask, is it a social service or is it a business? How do we think about healthcare? And I suspect for many of us, it's some of both. But this adds to, I think, part of our confusion, because we're not really sure how to think about healthcare in terms of the general public. Which is it? Lack of continuity. I heard a lot about this today. A lot of you were talking and I was amazed and impressed with the depth of your knowledge and the sophistication of your conversation uh, about how it, difficult it is to coordinate data for patients. So for instance, I go to South Dakota on vacation. And in South Dakota I have a coronary and I get rushed to a hospital emergency room, and the doctor asked me some questions. Have you had a coronary arteriogram? And what were the results? The doctor is relying on my memory because it is very difficult to find the results of my test in South Dakota. What if my results were instantaneously available anywhere to the appropriate provider? Very hard to achieve, as you all know and we've been working on it as an industry. Hospitals are tremendously different. There's rural hospitals, there's urban hospitals, there's for-profit, there's not-for-profit, there's uh, Catholic hospitals, there's not-for-profit, uh, non-entity hospitals. And, there, and let me tell you, having been part of the American Hospital Association Board of Trustees for a number of years, the needs, the wants, the desires, the motivation of those different entities is far different from each other. Very, very different in how they view the world. Now this is the one I like, market-driven. We've heard on the political scene, particularly from conservatives, and I'm not arguing, I'm just saying this is, that if we would let the wonders of the market work, we could cure our health care problems, because the market is vicious when it comes to high price and low quality. It rewards low cost and high quality. But the question is, it seems to me, is healthcare really market driven? Is it really market driven, like buying a refrigerator or a car? Now, I will tell you my answer. My answer is, at the margins, yes. At the margins, yes. We can train people to be cost conscious, use of HSAs and things like that. We can get them to say, doctor, I noticed that you ordered an MRI for me at Little Sisters of the Bottom Line Hospital. <laughs> but I went online and I saw that at Dr. Bob's auto shop and CAT scan facility, I could get it for $50 cheaper. We can train people to ask those kind of questions. 
and do that kind of work. But my sense, when it comes to the hard stuff, when it comes to cancer, heart disease, stroke, what we do is we say, doctor, if it were your husband, your wife, your mother, your father, what would you do? And we do it exactly what the doctor wants. The knowledge gap between even the most intelligent, well-researched layperson and the physician is so great, so great, that we are an uninformed consumer. And an informed consumer is the essence, is the essence of a market-driven enterprise. We are not informed consumers, for the most part, when it comes to our own health. So I would answer the question, yes, is it market-driven at the margins? In terms of the big stuff, I struggle with that. Unclear expectations of our rights as patients. There is clear expectations in some parts of this country that we as Americans ought to have the right to health care. Okay, well, let's examine that for a minute. And I'm not arguing, I'm just saying, let's, but let's examine it. Let's take it, take it apart. What other rights do we have? We have the right to free speech, but we do not have the right to yell fire in a crowded theater. We do not have the right to slander people maliciously. So our right to free speech is circumspect. When we say we have a right to health care, what's that mean? What, what does that entail? Does it entail emergency room visits? Okay. Does it entail inpatient visits? Okay. Does it entail routine doctor visits? Okay. Does it include plastic surgery? Does it include a mastectomy? Does it include a breast transplant? Does, I mean, uh, augmentation? Does it include a facelift? What does it include? My only point here is, before we say it's a right, we better be prepared to say how big is that right? Because once you draw the line and you say the right is this big, everybody on this side of the line says, oh, you missed it. It should have been this big. I don't know if many of you uh, pay attention to what happens in your own state house, but I'll, I'll tell you what happens in Oklahoma. Every year, there is a group of people who lobby the legislature for something to be included in their health plan that's not included in their health plan. They want it codified in the law that this is going to be included in health plans. Autism is the most obvious example. Parents that have autistic children have a tremendous expense, and we need to recognize that. But these same parents want autism included in their plan and for you, the policyholders, to pay for that. My only point is, before we say health care is a right, we better be prepared to define the right and what are the limitations of that right. Now, we're perfectly comfortable in saying education, K through 12, is the right of every child regardless of income, regardless of ethnicity, every child gets a K through 12 education. Period. End of discussion. And that right is administered at the local level by local school boards who you elect to make decisions on your behalf. There's no such equivalent in health care. view of death. There is an old saying that to the rest of the world, death is inevitable. And that for Americans, it's optional. There is some pill, there is some procedure, there is some advanced technique that will save us from the Grim Reaper. Go to any hospital intensive care unit in this country. Look at many of the patients in the bed. Some being kept alive at hundreds of thousands of dollars a day with no chance of recovery simply because the children cannot decide what to do with mom and dad. We've all heard the old star that 25 to 50 percent of everything spent on us is spent in the last six months of our lives. That's mostly true. We don't handle death well in the United States. And 
that's very costly. And unless you deal with that issue, you're going to be frustrated on the cost side of the equation. And also, when you get older, and I'm probably the oldest person in the room, I don't say that with any joy, when you get a little bit older, people look at you differently. The new Amazon Echo has everyone asking Alexa for help. Alexa, what time is it? What the hell is wrong with this blasted thing? Amanda! But the latest technology isn't always easy to use for people of a certain age. These kids have bought me a busted machine again. On yes, That's why Amazon partnered with AARP to present the new Amazon Echo Silver, the only smart speaker device designed specifically to be used by the greatest generation. It's super loud and responds to any name even remotely close to Alexa, so they can find out the weather. Allegra, what is the weather outside? It is 74 degrees and sunny. Huh? It is 74 degrees and sunny. Where? Outside. What about it? The temperature outside is 74 degrees and sunny. I don't know about that. <laughs> the latest in sports. Clarissa, how many did old Satchel strike out last night? Satchel Paige died in 1982. <laughs> how many did he get? Satchel Paige is dead. He what now? Died. Who did? Satchel Paige. Oh. I don't know about that. <laughs> Even local news and pop culture. Anita, what them boys up to across the street? They are just playing. They what now? They are just playing. You see, they just playing now? Yes, they are just playing. I don't know about that. Compared <laughs> to smart devices like your thermostat. Alessandra, turn the heat up. The room is already 100 degrees. <laughs> are you trying to kill me, Alize? The new Amazon Echo Silver plays all the music they loved when they were young. Angela, play black jazz. Playing, uh, jazz. It also has a quick scan feature to help them find things. Emilia, where did I put the phone? The phone is in your right hand. And it has an uh-huh feature for long rambling stories. So then I gave him five dollars. And he said, I only gave him one dollar. Uh-huh. I said, I didn't know I gave you a five. Uh-huh. Because I only had a five and a one only. Uh-huh. And this is the one dollar right here. Uh-huh. So, I mean, you tell me who's great. Amazon Echo Silver. Get yours today. I said get yours today. To order Amazon Echo Silver, send a check or money order to Amazon.com right now. All right. Number 11, variation in treatment. I think most of the physicians in the room are familiar with the Dartmouth Atlas. Dartmouth Atlas actually traces variation in treatment patterns across the country. And there are huge variations. Huge. Unexplained variations. Tulsa, Oklahoma is 90 miles from Oklahoma City. Clearly the same demographic population in terms of ethnicity, in terms of income levels, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. There may be in some clinical procedures a 50% difference between Tulsa and Oklahoma City. Hysterectomy rates, open heart surgery rates, unexplained variation. And it appears that much of what happens to us depends on the age of your physician, what their specialty is, how well they've kept up with recent research, and in some cases whether they in fact own what it is they're prescribing for you. And it's very clear, and the Dartmouth Atlas seems to validate this, that there may be as much as 30 to 40 percent unnecessary care because it is in variation with clinical principles. Clearly, you and I are part of the problem. Uh, we're all aware with the mother that lobbies the doctor to, to give her child an antibiotic when clearly the child's got a viral infection. We're all aware that the fact that pharmaceuticals routinely advertise for prescription drugs over the television. Why do they do that? The doctor has to write the script. You can't go into the pharmacy and buy this medication. You have to have a doctor's order. Why do they do that? They do it because it works. They know that 80% of the time when you ask a doctor, for a prescription, if it's not going to kill you, it's not going to hurt you, and the doctor's on a tight schedule, and rather than taking 15 minutes to describe to you why you don't need this, you're going to get the script. 
And the pharmaceutical companies know this. That's why they advertise Nexium, which has obviously gone local, but that's why they prescribe these kind of medicines over the television. American expectations. Our host, Nick, is from Australia. And I had a conversation with him about the healthcare system in Australia. And of course, it's a derivative of the English system. But in Australia, and I verified this because I sat next to an Australian on the, on the plane not recently, who said to me, <clears throat> we have the government system in Australia, but also you can have private insurance. And if you have private insurance, you go to the head of the line. You go to the head of the line. You get operated on before those that have government insurance. You get your MRI before those that have government insurance. Let me ask you a question. How does that, will that rankle the American public? Now, we are clearly used to the fact that money buys you some things, right? You all can go to the steakhouse tonight because you can afford it. I have to go to McDonald's because I can't afford it. You might be able to send your children to a private school. Well, my children go to the public school. And we're okay with that. But I have to wonder, are we okay? Are we really okay with the fact that someone will jump us in line because they have insurance? There's something about medicine that I think that's going to really bother the American consumer. I don't think that'll play well. So, I think words are part of our problem as well. You routinely hear in the debate, we have the very best healthcare system in the world. We talked about the technology and how good it was. We talked about all the thousands of physicians we have that are so well trained. But is it true we have the best healthcare system in the world? When we all know we don't rank near the top in any clinical category compared to other nations? Now, there are some reasons for that. We all know that. You know, if, if social spending is greater in, in other countries, we know that's a factor. But the fact is, we don't rank near the top. So how would we claim, by God, you cannot mess with the American health care system because it's the best in the world? Why would we say that? But we do. And we remember in the debate over the Affordable Care Act, the thing that we kept hearing here and again and again, you let this act pass, and there's going to be a group, <clears throat> a group of non-physicians that are going to make decisions about your health care. And, and if it costs too much, they're simply going to withhold care from you. And they call it death panels. And, you know, if we examine some of the, some of the other health care systems in the world, they take a much different view of life than we do. I'm sure you all have watched medical dramas on television. What happens in those medical dramas? Well, basically what, what happens in many of them is there is no cost too great to save one patient. No cost. That's not necessarily true in the rest of the world. They take a very different look at technology and whether it works or not and whether what are your chances of survival, and they make decisions based on that. And health care decisions should only be between you and your physician. We all want pride, praise and appreciate a warm and thoughtful relationship with our doctor. But the question is, is that a true statement? Healthcare decisions should only, key word, operative word is only, be between you and your physicians. Or in some cases, did that sort of get us to where we are? Now, let me give you a formula. Now, let me say at the outset, this is admittedly simplistic, very simplistic. But it helps the average citizen that you're trying to talk through healthcare with a chance to understand what's involved with changing health care. So in my formula, the, the quotient uh, is going to be, what's the cost of health care? And we multiply that, excuse me, the number of employees covered, if it's your business plan, if it's Medicaid, it's the number of Medicaid patients, but it's the number of people times the benefits, what's the copay, what's the deductible, what are the limitations of the use of that policy? So what are the benefits? 
times how many times you use those benefits. It's very clear that if you have an employee group of young men, they're much less costly than a group of older women because they use fewer health care services. Times what you pay providers. So there's the formula. The cost of health care is number of employees times the benefits times the utilization times what we pay providers. So if, you're gonna, if somebody comes to you, a politician comes to, you, to the public and says, we're going to lower the cost of health care, but we're going to increase the number of Medicaid patients. What do you got to say to them? Well, okay, tell me how you're, what are you going to do then? If you're going to increase the number of patients, you're going to lower the benefits? How are you going to control utilization? Or are you going to pay the doctors less and the hospitals less? I suspect most of you know the answer. They're going to pay the doctors and the hospital less because that's the only thing politically that's palpable. Now, I'm almost done. Now, the, 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 the health care law has several interesting parts, and of course, the mandate, the individual mandate, is, is very interesting. Because if you remember, in the most recent sort of debacle over the Republicans trying to appeal and replace the Affordable Care Act, the Republicans became very committed, very, very committed to no existing pre-existing conditions. Because politically, you have to be for no pre-existing conditions. But what's the problem with pre-existing conditions? The problem is, is that the insurance company has already lost the bet. And of course, the insurance company is taking a bet on all of us when they issue an insurance policy. So what would be similar would be to call up your insurance agency while your house is on fire and say, yeah, I know I haven't had homeowner's protection, but could I buy it now? That's pre-existing conditions. It's a loser for the insurance company. So in order to pay for it, what did they do? They skyrocketed premiums. And the Republicans follow along with something almost as dumb, saying, well, we want pre-existing conditions, but we don't want the mandate. Failing to understand the mandate pays for the pre-existing conditions. That unless you have everybody in the game, you can't afford pre-existing conditions. So let's go through the rest of these fairly quickly. Now, what are some of the consequences of the employer mandate? And I'm going to make a prediction here. And my prediction is that within 10 years, we will see the death of employer-based insurance. We will see the death of employer-based insurance, which is the bedrock of our American health care system from an insurance standpoint. And why is that? Let's think for a moment. Why do we provide health insurance? Why do your employers provide health care insurance in the first place? Well, maybe you provide it because you think it's a thing to do. But the real reason we provide it is because you cannot hire anybody without it. You cannot hire sophisticated employees without health insurance because they simply will not work for anybody with health insurance. The only people that work for employers that don't provide health insurance are the unskilled because they have no options. You have to provide health insurance. Now what happens the first time your competitor down the street says, we're dropping our health insurance, but we're going to send all of our employees to the exchange and let them buy insurance on our nickel. And you know what? They can still hire nurses. What are you going to do? You go, what are we, chop liver? Why are we doing this? And then once the first beam falls, it's going to go very, very quickly. And I think within a relatively short time, employer-based insurance is going to be a thing of the past. So the employer's got to deal with this increase of these new benefits not the least of which is pre-existing conditions. And you know, healthcare is a headache. And I went through this as a CEO of a large system for years. Every year I'd meet with our insurance broker and he'd say, well, your costs have gone up such and such. And if you're going to maintain, which is what we tried to do, if you're going to maintain that you pay for 75% of your employee's premium, if that's your goal, you're going to have to increase both your premium and theirs to keep that relationship. Otherwise, if you pay the same premium, you're going to be paying less than 75%. So 
So what else do you do? Well, you then you tighten the provider network, or you raise the deductible, or you raise the copay. You do all these things to reduce your premium. And what does that do? That pisses your employees off. That's what it does. And so here you are spending millions of dollars on this benefit, and everybody's mad about it. I think you're going to get out of the business. You're going to find a way to get out of the business. So back to the formula, you must control one element in the formula. You got a huge employee dissatisfaction anytime you make a change. And most importantly, what's the competition doing? So your choices are you increase the burden to employees, which makes them matter. You stop coverage and you send them to the internet, which is where I think we're all going. Or you, some of you may be into direct contracting. Some of you may use the, the, the power of your health system, direct contract with major employers. Or you may go to private. I think you will begin to see the private exchanges creep up. Now here's where I think we're eventually going to wind up. We're going to wind up like Walgreens. And what Walgreens does is very simple. They say, Susie, we're going to pay you $200 a month. The only thing you've got to do is to demonstrate to us that you've used it to buy health insurance. I don't care how you do it. I don't care what your plan looks like. I don't care what the deductible is. I don't care what the physician network is. I don't care any of this. You're getting $200 a month. I'm out of here. I don't need this anymore. And I think that's where we're going. Now, I'm just about done. There's a lot of people that say, well, you know, the Affordable Care Act doesn't say much about wellness. And it's true, it does, it's hardly anything about wellness. You know, wellness is, is, is an interesting topic. The, the, the problem with wellness, if you're an employer that provides really good wellness plan for your employees, you have a gym and you, and they get some incentive to do certain things, you know, bless you, because that's a wonderful thing to do. But you know what? Nobody's been able to come up with an ROI on wellness because the benefit is so far in the future that you cannot calculate it. That's why, why do you think insurance companies have never done wellness? It's because they know that by the time there's a benefit to what you've done and what they paid for, you're gonna be with another insurance company because of rollover. Here's the other thing about wellness. Folks, I hate to tell you this, but none of us are getting out of here alive. So if I save you with some extraordinary procedure today, you're going to live to tomorrow to die of something more expensive to treat. So we've got to be very careful when we talk about how things like wellness actually improve the cost of health care. Because I think you can demonstrate that maybe if you do some longitudinal studies that maybe there's a short-term benefit but if you look at, at wellness over decades, healthcare costs are not going to go down because we're only going to extend what we pay for sicker people in the future. So, very quickly, here's my, here, here's my thought. I think we can build a healthcare system that covers everybody without increasing taxes. And I think you do it by a couple of means. Number one, you implement evidence-based medicine. You follow the protocols. It's very clear you can save money by doing that. What we said, Dartmouth Atlas says 20, 40 percent. Everything we do may be unnecessary. Standards of information technology. Uh, studies seem to indicate about 20 percent of everything we do may be, uh, may be duplicative because we don't have the, the, the wherewithal to know that it's been done before. Serious tort reform. You use the money already in the system. We talked about the fact that, you know, 20 to 40 percent of everything spent on billing. You find a way to sort of curtail that monkey. Here's, this is my most fanciful one. It's just sort of a dream. Stimulate the development of not-for-profit insurance industry. So I'll close with this. Um, I'm the chairman of an organization called the Health Alliance for the Uninsured. 
and we consolidate the work of 16 free clinics in Oklahoma City. And we routinely see people like this. Lucy is a mother of two. Lucy works three jobs. One fast food restaurant, and she's a domestic in two homes. Works 70 to 80 hours a week. None of her employers provide her health insurance. Lucy is doing everything we can ask of an American citizen to do right by her family. Lucy comes to our free clinics. She's not a deadbeat. She's not living in a box under a bridge. She's not homeless. She just has no health insurance provided for her, so she goes to those blessed doctors and nurses that do it for free. I think in many cases, when, you, when we talk about health care reform in this country, we have totally forgotten about the Lucy's of this world. We focus on how we get insurance to people and we don't understand the depths of what it's going to take to really change the system. So Nick, thank you very much for the invitation. I've been very impressed with this group and how serious you are and how thoughtful you are, and I've been delighted to be with you. Thank you. And by the way, there is a copy of my book for each of you in the back. I'd be delighted to sign it if you'd like. Um, the only thing I ask of you is that when you read it, you send me your thoughts. It covers much of what I said today, but a lot more. And uh, so take it, read it, pass it to your friends, but tell me what you think. I'd be very thrilled with that. So I think I'm done unless there are questions. I was just going to say, we have time for a couple of questions if anyone has any for Stan. He, you're going to be here tomorrow? Or through? He's here for a while tonight? Yeah. So if anyone does around. have any questions, uh, please join me in thanking tonight's keynote speaker, Stan Huffelt. Thank you. As Stan mentioned, we do have copies of his book available.